formal theory of adjunctions, monads, algebras, and descent. All right, thanks very much. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers. I'm really happy to be here and have this opportunity to speak. Um, so when I think about uh, reimagining the foundations of algebraic topology, I think part of that project should be making the foundations easier to learn, uh, easier to understand. It can only enable. Uh, <laughs> 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 thanks. <laughs> It, you know, it also gives something for category theorists to do. But, um, right, so what I want to talk about today is uh, joint work with Dominic Verity of Macquarie University in Sydney uh, on algebraic structures, sort of a general theory of algebraic structures, adjunctions, monads, algebras for the monad, and eventually monadic descent theory. Uh, so this, this program has some new theorems. So the theorem here about homotopy coherent adjunctions is a new result, but it also has new proofs of old theorems. So the Monadicity theorem, which characterizes the universal property of algebras for a monad, is due in the quasi-categorical context to Jacob Lurie. Um, but we have a new proof of that result. It also applies a bit more generally. Um, and I'm equally excited about both directions, both the new theorems and just the new proofs. So the context for what I want to tell you about today is any infinity two category. So the two here is because adjunctions and monads are fundamentally uh, two categorical structures. You have non-invertible things at level zero, one, and two. Um, by an infinity two category, what I mean is a simplicially enriched category, so strictly enriched over simplicial sets, where the Hom spaces are quasi-categories. Okay. Uh, and so a special case of an infinity two category is a strict two category. Um, and I, I think that this, this sort of vision of these algebraic structures is, is interesting in both contexts, both in the strict two categorical context in the infinity two categorical context. And I really do mean to treat the two of them together. Um, so I think often what people mean when they, they say they're going to treat infinity two as the same as two is they're, it's a simplifying device for a talk where you, you're sweeping some complexity under the rug. Um, that's not at all the case here. Um, what, uh, what we'll see is I'll give the definition of algebras for a monad, descent data for a monad. It will be exactly the same definition in both the infinity two categorical case and in the two categorical case. The statements of the monadicity and descent theorems will be exactly the same in both contexts, and the proofs will be exactly the same in both contexts. There's nothing extra that happens behind the scenes in the infinity case. It's exactly the same always. Um, and the reason this is true is because our approach to these definitions is via something called weighted limits. Uh, I'll have an interlude where I explain what weighted limits are, but this um, gives a definition that sort of captures the fundamental shapes of these objects, and then the proof is all in the weights. It's essentially a context-free proof, which is why it works in both cases. So that's where we're going. Um, but before we get there, I want to give a bit of a pre-talk about, yeah. Are these slides going to be available? Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Right, so before we start, I want to give a bit of a pre-talk, which is about the special case. Uh, do you have to... Ah, thank you. <laughs> the special case. <laughs> That's, <good. laughs> That's really good. <laughs> of, of the two-category cap. So classical adjunctions, monads, algebras, and so on and so forth. Okay, so we'll start with an adjunction. So an adjunction, of course, it's a pair of categories, maybe A and B, a pair of functors, U and F. Um, I'm going to use this little turnstile, which is Kahn's original notation, to distinguish the left from the right adjoint. Um, and then one way to say that these things are an adjunction is to say that we have a unit a natural transformation from the identity to U or F, and a co-unit the other way that satisfy the triangle identities. And I could write down the triangle identities, but rather than do so, I'm going to say that they imply that I get the following bar resolutions of the adjunction. So there are four of these. One of them looks like this. We start from the identity at B. We use the unit to get to UF. And we have the unit U of the co-unit, UF of the unit to get to UF, UF. Then I have five maps in here, which I'll leave you to imagine, UF, 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 and so on and so forth. And what all this does is it defines a uh, augmented co-simplicial object in the Hom category from B to B. And let me draw one more of these. So in the Hom category from A to B, I have U, 
and also u f u. Uh, here's a unit map again. This is u of epsilon. I have four maps like this to u f u f u, and so on and so forth. Um, and this is a diagram whose shape is an augmented split uh, simplicial object, or if you will, it's the subcategory of delta containing all of the order-preserving maps that also preserve the top element in each ordinal. Um, Jacob uses this notation as well, and it's the same. Um, say again? Uh, yeah, sorry, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking there. Right. Right, so in the, it's in, this is a diagram in the HOM category from A and B, and there are two more. They're dual to these. Just turn around the arrows, replace U with F, eta with epsilon. Okay, so a summary of these four bar resolutions is to say that there is a two-functor from a small, strict two-category adge into cat. Uh, and what this does, this adge has two objects, plus and minus, which go to the two categories, which are spanned by this adjunction. Um, and then it has four HOM categories. So the HOM from plus to plus is this delta plus. Its image gives the monad resolution. This is the opposite of the HOM from minus to minus. That's where the comonad lives. And then we have these other two categories, one of which is delta infinity, and the other is the opposite of delta infinity. So the bar resolutions of an adjunction are encoded as a two-functor like this. And so the upshot of this, the summary of the discussion, is that this adge, this two-category, is the free adjunction. Uh, by which I mean that a two-functor from adge into cat is just exactly the same as an adjunction in this two-category. It's exactly an adjunction I mean, a junction between categories, but the way I'll say it later is in its a junction in the two category cat. Okay. So those are junctions. What about monads? So there's a similar story here. I'm going to define monad to be a subcategory of this adge that is full on the object plus. And exactly as before, this monad, MND, is the free monad, by which I mean to say that a two-functor from monad into cat is exactly a category with a monad in it, monad on it. In other words, a monad in cat. So what does this data look like? So this monad has a single object, plus, so it goes to some category B. And then uh, there's a diagram on HOM categories like above, and this is the monad resolution. So it'll be a map from delta plus into the HOM category from B to B. Uh, that starts at the identity, uses the unit for the monad. I'm going to give the monad a name. I'll call it T. It's the image of the distinguished endomorphism, the free monad in here. And I have eta mu, T of eta to T squared. And I continue in this fashion, T cubed and so on and so forth. So the two functors are strict? Yes, yeah, everything is strict. If I, if I make an assertion today, you should interpret it up to isomorphism. I'll be very clear if I mean anything weaker. So yeah, everything's strict. Um, but uh, eventually, this target two category could be something that has pseudo functors. So, um, so right, so the, the diagrams are strict, but you can interpret this data in a number of weaker ways, which is uh, why this is cool. So, OK, um, great. So the, so that's a monad. I suppose examples are overdue. So in, uh, any adjunction you have in mind works, but uh, maybe some adjunctions I have in mind are that encode algebraic structure, something like the free forgetful adjunction between sets and abelian groups. So the induced monad under here I might denote like this. It uh, sends a set to the set of finite formal sums of elements in that set. Uh, another example as if R and S are commutative rings with unit. Uh, and say I have a ring homomorphism from R to S. I have a restriction, induction, a junction, whose induced monad you might call S tensor over R blank. There are also, of course, induced co-monads here, but we're not going to focus on them as much. OK. So that's adjunctions and monads. 
So when we have a monad in the context of a monad, we can ask what is an algebra, an algebra for the monad. So the answer in the, the first case, this junction between sets and abelian groups, or the, the, the induced monad on sets, is the following. So an algebra will be a set X together with a map from the monad applied to that set back to X. So what this does is it takes a finite formal sum of elements in X and evaluates it at a element in the set. Um, and then there's some axioms, but again, rather than tell you what the axioms are, I will say that they imply that I get a following resolution or a following diagram. So starting from X, I have the monad resolution evaluated at X, which looks like this. This is Z of Z of X, so this is uh, finite formal sums of finite formal sums of elements in X, and so on and so forth. Uh, but then I also have this map beta. Uh, Z of beta, and so on. Uh, and all this together defines a diagram of shape delta infinity in set. So that tells you what the axioms are for the algebra for the monad. And indeed, what we'll do later is we'll define the category of algebras for a monad to be a subcategory of a diagram category, to be diagrams of shape delta infinity in the category which has the monad. This will be as a weighted limit. Weighted limit. And the upshot of this definition is the following. So uh, firstly, from this definition of algebras, I can form what's called the monadic adjunction, which is an adjunction between the base category which has the monad and this category of algebras. Uh, I also had the original adjunction that gave us the monad. And there will be a comparison functor like this that commutes with the right adjoints. And all of that will come just for free from the nature of this definition with no reference to the ambient context. OK, the last thing to preview is what is descent. Uh, so uh, one way to describe monadic descent is to say that it is about identifying objects in the image of the right adjoint of a monadic adjunction. Both of these happen to be monadic, which means that the comparison functor over there is an equivalence of categories. Um, so uh, I guess the original case due to Grotendieck was about recognizing when S modules are induced from R modules. Um, and a theorem, well, so the start of the answer is to say uh, we look at the extra data that's present for the, on the objects that are in the image. And uh, it's a theorem that in many of these cases, and certainly in the cases of monadic descent, uh, what this descent data is, is it's a coalgebra structure for the induced co-monad, co-monad on the category of algebras. OK, so let's just take that for granted. So what that means in particular is what is in this example. Let's do the R modules one. So a way to characterize descent data is to say, firstly, it's an R module. Again, I always have the monad resolution. So I can write S tensor over R X, S tensor over R, S tensor over R with X. But then I have additional data of being an algebra for the monad. So that's a multiplication map coming back, which makes this R module into an S module. Uh, there's also one of it here. And then I have an additional thing that makes, uh, that gives a coalgebra structure for the induced co-monad on algebras. That's this gamma. And there's a copy of it here, and so on and so forth. And all of this assembles to a diagram of shape delta in the category of R modules. And again, what we're going to do is we'll define the category of descent data to be a subcategory of its diagram category as a weighted limit. OK, and as was true previously, we get some consequences of this immediately, yeah. uh, which is the following. So what I've introduced so far is I've introduced three basic shapes uh, that all happen to be categories with a monad on them. And these shapes are delta plus, delta infinity, delta. So all three of these categories have a monad. It's actually the same monad in each case. It's just shift the objects up 
by one. So I'm, rather than write the name for the monad, I'm just going to write the name for the category on which the monad acts. Uh, so I have these three basic categories. And the role they're going to play is that they serve as the weights for, or the shapes of, is good intuition. Firstly, the underlying object. So if I have a monad on some other category, this will just return that category. This will be the object of algebras. This is how we'll define the category of algebras. And this will be the descent object. So we'll, this is how we'll define descent data. And again, there is an immediate consequence of these weighted limits definition, which is the following. So firstly, in categories, I have inclusions. So delta is a subcategory of delta plus. Delta infinity, which was the top preserving maps, sits in there. Here's the composite inclusion. Uh, and moreover, I have adjunctions. I have adjoints here. And this diagram lives in the category of categories with a monad, or this notation also suggests the functor category. That's really what I mean. Remember, a two-functor from monad into cat is just the category with a monad. So read that as categories with a monad or the functor category either way. So I have this diagram. So then when I apply this weighted limit, uh, it's a contravariant process. So what I'll get here is the underlying object, uh, the descent object, the object of algebras. All these maps turn around. So this will be a commuting diagram. And then I have these adjoints. And if you're, oops, if you're familiar with monadic descent theory, this is the bit that you get for free with no additional hypotheses. And the reason you get these functors for free, of course, is that they're all in the weights. They just came from the defining categories. What are you thinking about? Uh, so the diagram will be a monad somewhere else, so in, in categories right now, but it will eventually be anywhere. Um, OK. So that's the pre-talk. Um, great. Uh, so now, now we'll get back down to business. Um, I realize not all of you will have been present for the pre-talk, so I'm not going to assume any knowledge, specific <laughs> knowledge of it. We'll cover, <laughs> we'll cover everything again. <laughs> OK, so the first thing I want to talk about is the context for the results, which is any infinity two category, by which I mean a simplicially enriched category whose Hahn spaces are quasi-categories. And this is a strict simplicial enrichment. OK, so one thing you might remember about quasi-categories, these are the simplicial sets with the inner horn filling condition, uh, is that we have categories embedded inside quasi-categories via the nerve functor. And there's a left adjoint to this inclusion, which takes the homotopy category of a quasi-category. So a quasi-category presents some sort of homotopy theory. And the homotopy theory is the homotopy category, which is just this left adjoint here. Um, so both this nerve functor and this homotopy category functor preserve finite products, which means I also get an adjunction on things that were enriched in those things. So a strict uh, two category are things enriched in categories. Uh, Infinity two categories, by definition, are things enriched in quasi-categories. So again, I have an inclusion. This is how we regard two categories as a special case of infinity two categories. And I also have this homotopy two category functor that takes an infinity two category, does some sort of quotienting process. We throw away the higher dimensional cells in the Hom spaces. Uh, we use the two simplices to identify relations between the one simplices, and I get a strict two category out. Uh, and this will be the two category of an infinity category. So if I take uh, quasi categories themselves form an infinity two category, the thing I get here is the two category of quasi categories due to Andre Joyal. OK. Um, so one, the thing I want to emphasize right now is that these embeddings, this nerve functor and then this inclusion, are both full and faithful. And one principle in the development of the category theory of quasi categories is that if I define any notion for quasi-categories, it should restrict on categories to the classical categorical notion. So um, when in the special case of categories, I always mean by definitions what I meant before. And in particular, well, uh, I'm not going to introduce notation. So you'll never see another nerve on <laughs> these slides, even though they really secretly appear all over the, pace, the place. We're going to identify categories with their nerves whenever convenient. Um, and we're going to regard two category theory as sort of a special case of this infinity two category theory. OK, so some examples. Uh, so of two categories, uh, we have the cat that I just described previously. We could have monoidal categories. 
uh, strong monoidal functors, we could have accessible categories, accessible functors. Uh, more generally, algebras for any two monad on a complete category. And the reason that the examples have the flavor they do is halfway through the talk, when I start talking about weighted limits, I'm going to have to introduce a completeness hypothesis. And these examples all satisfy that condition, so they'll work all the way through. Um, uh, for infinity two categories, quasi-categories are maybe the uh, dramatic example. So the, just take the standard enrichment of simplicial sets in itself. Hom spaces between quasi-categories are quasi-categories, so that's an example of an infinity two category. Uh, complete Siegel spaces also have an enrichment over quasi-categories, so they're another example. Um, and more generally, what I might call RESC objects, by which I mean, if you start with your favorite model category, you look at simplicial objects in that model category, you give it the Reedy model structure, and then you localize for, to get the Siegel condition and the completeness condition. What that localization does is it turns the Reedy model structure into something that's enriched over Joyal's quasi-categorical model structure. So that's another example. Again, all three of these will satisfy the completeness condition that I'll introduce at some point. So this is the sort of thing we have in mind. Okay, okay so far? Well, I mean, so, so their, their setup's kind of totally different. A model for infinity and categories is firstly a quasi category. But uh, I don't, you know, what I'm really talking about is the category theory of these things. And I don't think, which, which, which I don't think is really addressed in their paper, um, but also I don't, uh, the, the category theory that we're going to present here is exactly the same as what's accepted in higher Topolis theory, so, so I, I'm not changing the, I'm not changing the category theory. Okay, well, right, I guess that's the right, so the Siegel spaces is the universal one, so, so good. I didn't hear that, but it's... Oh, good, yeah, right. The, the universal one satisfies the axioms, great. Okay, <laughs> so right, so adjunctions. Uh, so again, we have this two category, the strict two category that is the free adjunction. It has two objects, then it has four HOM categories as indicated here. And its universal property, which is a theorem of Shanuel and Street, is that adjunctions in any other strict two category are exactly a two-functor whose domain is this adj. And again, what the two-functor does is it picks out the bar resolutions of the adjunction. These are the two I drew before, but there are two <coughs> others as well. Sorry, can you remind us what delta plus and delta Yeah, so delta plus, well, delta plus is this shape. It's an augmented, uh, so it's, it's the category of finite ordinals in order preserving maps. Uh, people often draw its shape as an augmented cosimplicial object, which is the thing I'm suggesting here. Um, delta infinity is the subcategory of delta, so that's uh, finite non-empty ordinals in order preserving maps. And then the maps have to preserve additionally the top element in each ordinal. Uh, right, so, th so these are just categories, ordinary categories. Okay. Right, so what is the free homotopy coherent adjunction? So in the context of infinity two categories, um, we have this higher dimensional structure, and the, the sort of adjunctions I'm gonna discuss today are called homotopy coherent. So we have this theorem of Shanuel and Street, and so motivated by it, I'm gonna define a homotopy coherent adjunction in an infinity two category to be a simplicially enriched functor whose domain is this adjugin. again. So remember, we're identifying two categories with their image in infinity two categories. So I'm applying the nerve to the Hom spaces, and so now I can talk about a simplicially enriched functor. And this definition, again, corresponds to the, the previous theorem where we think of adjunctions as encoded by a two functor. I'm gonna define a homotopy coherent adjunction to be a simplicial functor. So a priori, it's not clear that this is a good definition. We'll get there in just a second. Uh, let me unpack it, though. So what is the data of a homotopy coherent adjunction? Uh, firstly, it picks out two objects of the infinity two category two quasi-categories, two complete Siegel spaces, a pair of maps between them, these will be the left and the right adjoints, then some one simplices in the HOM spaces, which represent the unit and the co-unit, 
And then there's a bunch of higher data. Okay, so that's, that's, that's maybe a bad thing, but it, it, it's, we actually have a really good handle on exactly the data in a homotopy coherent adjunction um, because we have a really good handle on the data in the simplicial category adj. So this is the image of the two category under the nerve functor. Um, and what is it? So this simplicial category adj has two objects plus and minus. It has two sort of distinguished zero simplices, which I'll draw like this as squiggles going down and going up. Uh, the unit and the co-unit will be represented by one simplices like this. And more generally, an n arrow in one of the four Hom spaces of adj of this simplicial category is what we'll call a strictly undulating squiggle on n plus one lines. So this is, a, this is again a bijection. The n arrows are precisely this. So here n is equal to four. This is, represents a four simplex. I can tell which of the four Hom spaces it's in uh, we use composition order, so this squiggle starts at minus and ends at plus, so it's something in the HOM from minus to plus. I'm claiming this is a four simplex in the HOM space, and one way to do that is I can tell you what its faces are. So it has four co-dimension one faces, which are three simplices, and how I define them. Well, so if I want to take the second face, I'm going to remove the line labeled two. So now I get a picture like this. You'll see I've got this little turnaround inside a... a gap, that's not strictly undulating. Strictly undulating means I can only turn around uh, sort of once inside a gap and then I have to cross over the line again. But you just straighten out the picture. Yes, yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah, all my spaces will be quasi-categories. Yeah, <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, great. Uh, so again, you know, the process of taking the second face is I remove the line and then I sh well, and then I shake out the picture if I have to shake out the picture. Um, okay. Uh, can you do that one more time slowly, just the shaking out the picture, and kind of see what happens? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, <laughs> 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 uh, I wasn't sure if you were making fun of me or if that was an actual question. <laughs> uh, either way, it's okay. But all right, so so we're gonna take the second face. So I remove the line labeled two. Um, but I have this little turnaround in here, uh, and I'm just going to pull the string taut, and that gives us this picture. Yeah. Um, so that's that's an application of the triangle identity. Whenever that happens, by the way. Um, right. So I also can see the degenerate simplices. So if I want to take one of the degenerate things, I just duplicate a line and then pull the picture apart. So in particular, this simplex. Yes. Uh, they can be as long as they want, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, finite, but yeah, okay. Uh, so, so this one is degenerate on either its third or fourth faces because there's nothing, no turnarounds happening in that gap there. So this is a degenerate simplicity. So the composition structure in the simplicial category is just horizontal juxtaposition as long as the squiggles start and end at the same place. I can juxtapose them. Uh, in particular, I can also factor squiggles. This one factors as something from minus to plus, plus to minus, and then minus to plus. And that's sort of a unique factorization property into atomic things, which is going to be really, really important in a second because this is actually a cofibrant simplicial category, which is a huge surprise. I took a two category, I applied the nerve to the Hom spaces, and I get something that's cofibrant in Julie Bergner's model structure on simplicial categories. But it is because it's a simplicial computad, which is a characterization of the cofibrant objects. So that's really good because I'm claiming this is a free, free thing, free homotopy coherent adjunction. Okay. So is this just uh, taking a two category that you get like you can consider like a coherent category of person and n one and n r two where the monad of s is like placing next to each other. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I, I guess I don't know how that construction works exactly. Um, I mean, the, this, this definitely suggests a lot of things. So in low dimensions, it's the string diagram calculus for an adjunction. Uh, I mean, the important thing here is we have these, these layers which tell the, distinguish the simplices and the dimensions. Um, I'm not sure you should ask. Um, maybe one thing to mention, uh, this simplicial category is actually isomorphic to a hammock localization. Uh, it's the hammock localization of the walking weak equivalents. Uh, that's Carol Sumillo told me that. That's kind of fun. Okay, right. So, so a homotopy coherent adjunction again is a 
in an infinity two category is just the simplicial functor whose domain was this thing adj. So it has the sort of data indexed by these strictly undulating squiggles. And the theorem is that any adjunction in the homotopy two category of an infinity two category, so any adjunction up to homotopy actually extends to all of this data. <coughs> so even though we mean something very strict, we mean a lot of compatibly chosen simplices in all dimensions, uh, strict composition and everything, examples are abundant. Any adjunction up to homotopy gives an example. So for instance, if we're thinking about the, the infinity two category of quasi-categories, um, you can start with any adjunction between model categories, replace it by simplicial Quillen adjunction, uh, then you get an adjunction between the associated quasi-categories of these model categories, though that definition already is a little tricky because the left adjoint takes cofibrin objects to cofibrin objects, the derived left adjoint, but it doesn't necessarily land in the fibrin object. So even defining the functor on the quasi-category level is a little tough. Proving that it's a junction on the, in the homotopy two category of quasi-categories is a little tough. But once I've done that, I can extend and get all this higher dimensional coherence <coughs> data. That's what this theorem is saying. And the same thing in the other contexts. So, so it's an explicit theorem. It's a, so what we do is we filter adj, which was a simplicial computad, as a sequence of subcomputads, and then we show that there is no obstruction to each choice of atomic data. So yeah, that's how it goes. Um, this doesn't require any of the completeness hypotheses I mentioned previously. So as long as you're enriched over quasi-categories, this theorem is true. Um, and moreover, the spaces of extensions are contractible con-complexes. So I say spaces because we actually have a, a number of choices here. You could start with just the left adjoint and extend a homotopy coherent adjunction. I could have the left, the right, and the co-unit and extend a homotopy coherent adjunction. Left, right, unit, co-unit a representative of one of the triangle identities extend to the homotopy coherent adjunction and all the way up. And each space of extensions uh, can define as a simplicial set and it is a contractible con complex. So that's, now I think I feel justified in calling this the free homotopy coherent adjunction. Okay, so the upshot of this for the rest of the talk is when I talk about homotopy coherent adjunctions, there are lots of examples because you just need an adjunction up to homotopy. Um, and as I was explaining to Hero, uh, the, the proof makes use of the fact that this adj is a cofibrin object, a simplicial computad, and maybe more precisely, it's cellularly cofibrin. So I built it by attaching, generating cofibrations. I don't have to take retracts anywhere. Um, that'll be important at some point. Okay, so we immediately get a notion of homotopy coherent monad, just as before. So I'm going to define monad to be the full subcategory on plus. So the full subsimplicial category in this infinity two context and define a homotopy coherent monad in an infinity two category to be a simplicial functor like this. So what the data is, is I send the single object plus to some B, so some quasi category, some complete Siegel space. Then I have this monad resolution. And again, if we're in the infinity two context, this HOM BB is a quasi category. So delta plus really means the nerve of delta plus so I can start by drawing this picture that I drew before, but really I also mean there's a bunch of higher data. And I can keep track of the higher data in a traditional way. This tells us something that I'm going to get an induced monad on the homotopy category of the quasi-category. Um, or I can keep track of it using this graphical calculus. So this two simplex, two simplex corresponds to that squiggle. This squiggle is some sort of uh, associativity condition. So the the way uh, the data of a, a homotopy coherent monad comes to you is you'll have an n airy multiplication law for each n. And this is saying something about the various uh, composites of these multiplication laws, that three simplex. Okay, so one word of warning, I don't have an analog of the previous theorem in this context. So a monad in the homotopy two category need not lift to a homotopy coherent monad. And the reason is that a monad is an algebraically defined structure, it's just an endomorphism, some natural transformations, and some equations, whereas a, a junction has a universal property. You can say it's the uh, co-unit, which is terminal in some slice category or something. 
Uh, so, so like an A3 structure on a space doesn't necessarily mean it's an A infinity space. I don't, I don't get this higher coherent stuff for free. So the, our examples of homotopy coherent monads will come from adjunctions. If I have an adjunction in the homotopy 2 category, I get a homotopy coherent adjunction and I can restrict to a homotopy coherent monad. But you don't get one for free just from an up to homotopy monad. So that's a bit different. Okay. So let's pause and review what's, <laughs> what's happened so far. So uh, we're talking about these algebraic structures in an infinity 2 category. Um, uh, which just means something enriched over quasi-categories, and we'll call them a homotopy coherent adjunction and a homotopy coherent monad. And in both cases, what this means is a simplicial functor. So it's a bunch of data that's characterized by these squiggle pictures, or you can just forget about it and think about adjunctions and monads in your favorite two category. That works equally well. Um, and so now we want to extract some algebraic structure from these things. So we want notions of algebras for the monad. And we want uh, essentially dis descent data for associated to a monad. And the way we're going to get there is using something called weighted limits. So let me tell you now about weighted limits. Um, so a so, uh, weighted limit is the following. So we have a diagram that we want to take the limit of. And I'm allowed to vary the shape of the limit notion. And that's the role of the weight. So when I have a weight and I have a diagram, I get out uh, weighted limit. So K here is, a, as before, it's a two category or an infinity two category. The shape of the diagrams, A will always be a small two category. So even in the infinity two context, it'll be the nerve of a two category. Those are the only diagrams we're going to have to consider. So the diagram is going to be a functor from A to K. It's a two functor if these are two categories. It's a simplicial functor if these are simplicial categories. Uh, the weight is then going to be a two-functor from A to cat, or secretly it should be a simplicial functor from A to simplicial sets in, uh, in the case of an infinity two category. But for the most part, we're only going uh, to see weights that look like two-functors. So let's, let's just write it like this. Uh, and then the weighted limit is going to be some process that combines this weight and this diagram and produces an object of K. Okay. Right, so here are some facts about the weighted limit. The first thing is there's some formula. This is a functor cotensor product. Uh, you might recognize that it's an N, whatever. There's a formula. Um, again, this is defined up to isomorphism. This is a, this is a very explicit computation. Uh, fact two is if my weight is a representable functor and I have a diagram, then all I do to take the weighted limit is I just evaluate at the representing object. So this is the innate lemma in this context. Uh, and the third fact is that if I have a bunch of weights and I form their colimit, then I could take all the weighted limits, and that will be the resulting limit notion will be the limit of each of the individual weighted limits. So in plain language, the weighted limit, if I have a weight W, a diagram D, is just some limit formula, so it's something defined explicitly. If I had a representable weight, then I evaluate at the representing object. And if I have a colimit of a bunch of weights, then I get a limit of the weighted limit notions. So sometimes I like to say weighted limits can be made to order. If you want a particular limit notion of some shape, you have this vague idea in mind, maybe in the context of a Reedy category or something, you can come up, cook up the right uh, weight by gluing together a bunch of representables. So let's see how this works. So for example, uh, yeah. Uh, so I mean the uh, right. So the universal property in the two categorical case will be some isomorphism of categories, and in the infinity two categorical case will be some isomorphism of simplicial sets. Yeah, uh, it's an actual. Yeah, yeah. Everything is strict unless I'm very, very clear that it's not. Yeah. So it's an isomorphism. Um, right. So what you know, one thing. One maybe contrast to this approach to monadicity is when I define the, like the quasi-category or the complete Siegel space of algebras for a monad, I mean a particular object in the equivalence class of such things. So we'll, we'll give an explicit construction. This thing, yeah, this thing outputs one object, and then we'll show that that represents the right thing. It has the appropriate universal property. Yeah. Um, 
Right. I mean, if I want to say what the universal property is, it would represent cones of shape W over the diagram. Okay. Yeah. Right. So let's think of an example. So A now is just going to be the shape of a pullback diagram. So if I took the ordinary limit, I would get the pullback, but I want a limit of a different shape. Uh, so I'm going to define my weight as follows. Um, I'm going to use simplicial notation because it'll be a little more familiar. So I start from the initial functor, so just nothing. And I'm going to attach representables at B and C, so the two edges of my pullback diagram, um, paired with zero simplicity. So I'm just going to attach those representable functors. That gives us the coproduct of the two representables. And then I'm going to attach uh, the representable at A, but paired with a one simplex along its boundary. So I'm thinking I want a point over B and C, and I want a one simplex over A, and that defines W. And by the thing about representables and the thing about colimits that I said previously, if I take this weighted limit, it gives the comma object. So it's uh, an element would be an object of B, or an object of the image of B, an object of the image of C, and then a one simplex, or a, you know, path between them like this. So this is very similar to the, the Bousfield kahn homotopy pullback. It's not quite the same. I'd have to modify it slightly. Um, but what I'm trying to illustrate is this is an example of what I'm going to call a cellular weight. So it's a cell complex in the projective model structure on this category of two functors in the two categorical case, or this category of infinity two functors in, or simplicial functors in the infinity two categorical case. So you just build it up by attaching representables tensored with the generating cofibrations. Um, and so an example of this would be bousfield kahn homotopy limits. So there's a, those are an explicit model for homotopy limits that are a weighted limit, and the weight happens to be one of these cellular weights, so one of these cell complexes. All right, and henceforth, I'm going to have a completeness hypothesis, which is that K, my two category, or my infinity two category, admits cellular weighted limits, so admits weighted limits like this. And the point of all the examples I mentioned previously is that this is satisfied in those cases for model theoretic reasons in the infinity two case and for two categorical reasons in the other case. These are the pi limits, by the way, if you know what pi limits are in a two categorical case. Okay. Right, so now we're going to define algebraic structure. So suppose I have a homotopy coherent monad. Um, by an abuse, I'm just going to think of it as the object which has the monad acting on it. Okay, and our goal is to define firstly the object of algebras. So this is the complete Siegel space of algebras for the monad, say. Uh, and then also this monadic homotopy coherent adjunction, connecting it back to the object on which the monad acts. All right, so how do we do this? So we have the monad, which is encoded by a simplicial functor like this. And then monad sits inside adj, and we want to extend this functor to get something like this. This will be the monadic homotopy coherent adjunction. And you might remember that the universal property of a monadic thing is that it's terminal in the category of adjunctions with a given monad. So the way to do this is you just take the right con extension. This is sort of a known categorical thing. Okay, but there's a formula for right con extensions in terms of weighted limits. And from this formula, I can extract what the weight should be. Uh, and the weight, so the diagram here is B in, it's a monad in K, and the weight is delta infinity. So it's this particular category with the shift by one monad acting on it. So the summary is I'm going to define algebras to be this particular weighted limit. And the diagram is the thing with the monad. Uh, the weight is this particular category with a monad acting on it, and it's this weighted limit, so it's some equalizer. Okay, let's unpack what this means. Here is the definition again. So in an example, taking the infinity two category of quasi-categories, so B is now a quasi-category with a homotopy coherent monad acting on it. Uh, Alge B is again a quasi-category, and I can look at what its vertices are. So a vertex will be a map from delta infinity to B. We'll notice I'm defining this as an equalizer, so it's a subobject of the Hom quasi-category from the nerve of delta infinity into B. And so what a vertex is, is it's a map like this that looks as follows. So it picks out some vertex little b of B. It gives the monad resolution, but then also a map back and higher things and higher data, which I haven't displayed. You know, really, this is a diagram from the nerve of delta infinity into B. So it's a homotopy coherent diagram 
of shape delta infinity and b. This will be our model for the quasi-category of algebras for a homotopy coherent monad. OK, so to justify this model, uh, if, you, if you don't believe me now, um, I'm now, this, this is my favorite slide, by the way. So uh, <laughs> I'm going to define the monadic homotopy coherent adjunction that connects this object of algebras, the quasi-category complete single space of algebras, to the quasi-category that had the monad on it. And it's, this, this is really uh, emblematic of kind of all the proofs. They're, they're really this easy. So let's, let's say it's all in, the slogan is it's all in the weights. So the weights, remember, were categories with a monad on them. We had delta infinity, which was the weight for algebras, and delta plus, uh, which is the weight for the underlying object. This is the representable functor on monad. Monad has one object plus, and this is its representable functor. So if I take the weighted limits of these two things, so delta infinity is how we defined algebras. Delta plus returns the underlying object B by the Yaneda lemma. That was one of the principles of weighted limits. Um, usually we think of the weighted limit functor as being contravariant in the weight, but it's convenient for me to put the op on the outside for right now. OK. All right, so these are the two objects we're trying to connect by an adjunction. How do we do it? Well, we re remember where these weights came from. So they were some formula involving pointwise right con extensions, and it turns out that both of these weights are restrictions of representable functors on edge. So if we take the representables, covariant representables at plus and minus, and just restrict to the subcategory monad, I get these two weights. Of course, representables come from edge itself via the UNADA embedding. Uh, and well, edge is the free Q category or simplicial category containing an adjunction, so I have an adjunction here that perpetrates all the way through. So you'll notice the composite that I've written is a two functor from adj to k or a simplicial functor from adj to k. So it is the free homotopy coherent adjunction. This is this comes along from the weights. So okay. Cool. So one thing I haven't really, I've been kind of sweeping under the rug until now. Um, we recognize these weights as coming from adj. Adj being a simplicial computad implies that these weights are these cellular cofibrant weights, which is how I know that this alg B, which I define to be some equalizer in simplicial sets, is actually a quasi-category, or the analogous thing for complete Siegel spaces. Um, these fibrant objects have some sort of limits, these cellular limits. And I, I'm always landing in there. I don't have to take a fibrant replacement ever. The thing that I describe, uh, define up to isomorphism just so happens to be a quasi-category or a complete Siegel space. OK. OK, so maybe a question stop for reality check. I've just told you that if I have any homotopy coherent monad, I get its monadic adjunction. Or if I had any monad in a two category, I get its monadic adjunction just by some weighted limit trick. Um, so you might wonder, doesn't this imply that these up to homotopy monads uh, have monadic adjunctions and thus lift to infinity two category level and give a homotopy coherent monad? Um, the answer is no, because the homotopy two category of an infinity two category won't have these cellular weighted limits, which are necessary for this definition. Um, the two category of quasi-categories, for instance, is Cartesian closed, but has very few strict two limits. So that's, you really have to work on the infinity two level in those cases. Um, OK. So that was algebras. Uh, now let me say something about descent. So again, we're going to fix a homotopy coherent monad in K. So a descent datum, uh, we'll take as definition, is a coalgebra for the induced monad on the object of algebras. So in other words, we can define descent to be the coalgebras for the algebras of B. And this, again, forces a weighted limits definition on it. So here I should thank uh, Jonathan Beardsley, who was the one who asked me whether our machinery had anything to do with descent theory. Um, I didn't know anything about descent theory at the time, but it, it occurred to me that it must. Um, and so what you do is you take the diagram that is the homotopy coherent monad. You have some weighted limits formula for the monadic adjunction. You can restrict that to coalgebras, which is the, or the co-monad, which is the other side. Then you have a weighted limits formula for the co-monadic adjunction. You can restrict that to get the object of coalgebras for algebras, and then translate all this into a weight for the original diagram. And I did this computation, I think, in my first week at MSRI, having no idea what the answer ought to be. 
Uh, and it turns out that the answer is the category delta, which if you know something about monadic descent, you might have guessed. Um, but, but again, this was entirely forced. That we didn't make any clever choices. You just follow your nose, and this is what it has to be. OK, so again, I'm defining the descent object. So it would be an object of k as a weighted limit of the homotopy coherent monad. The weight is delta. So there's some formula. It's a sub-object of uh, this cotensor. And for instance, in, for the infinity two category of quasi-categories, a vertex will be a map from the nerve of delta into B that looks like this. So it looks like the thing I mentioned previously. Plus, of course, the higher data that I'm not describing. OK. Moreover, I have various maps between weights. So these are all categories with a monad. These are functors that commute strictly with the monad. Yeah. Right, so, so K is in. Right, so yes, yeah, so to say a vertex, I had to specialize to a particular example, because I don't, I don't have, there's a, there's a generalized elements language that I could have used in complete generality, but I, that's, that's confusing. Um, <laughs> so, so, so sorry, the, the descent object, so B is an object of K, an infinity two category with a homotopy coherent monad acting on it. The descent object will also be an object of K. And if I want to like, understand the definition, then I can think in a particular example about what these things actually mean. But the definition is at that level of generality. Yeah. Um, OK. Right. So, so just one other thing I want to observe is I have three categories with monads acting on them. And I have various functors that commute strictly with these monad actions, regarding all of these as weights, and then applying the weighted limit functor I get the following diagram, uh, which, as before, this is the monadic homotopy coherent adjunction. This will be the co-monadic homotopy coherent adjunction. This is a comparison map. These are all simplicial functors, I guess, if you want, in that context. Uh, and so this is the stuff that comes formally with no additional hypotheses on B, the quasi-category, the complete Siegel space. OK. So the last thing I want to talk about in the last t uh, 10 minutes is how we prove the monadicity and descent theorems. And I don't actually have to say too much about it, because the, the upshot is it's exactly as you do in ordinary category theory. Um, but but there's, there's sort of one step we need to get there. So, uh, so sorry, the monadicity theorem characterizes the universal property of this ALGB, this object of algebras for homotopy coherent monad. The descent theorem says something rather about this descent object. OK. And the way you prove these things classically is I'll need some notion of a co-limit of a simplicial object inside B. So B has the monad acting on it. I can think about a simplicial object in B in examples or abstractly. And then I need a notion of a geometric realization for something like that. Or dually, for the descent, I'll need a notion of a totalization of a co-simplicial object taking values in an object in an infinity two category. So these are co-simplicial objects in a particular complete Siegel space or something. OK, so I'm going to tell you how to make these definitions. Ah. Right. So an object, B and K, admits totalizations. That means if I have a co-simplicial object valued in B, uh, it admits totalizations. The definition is if and only if there is an absolute right lifting diagram in the homotopy two category of the quasi category, or the infinity two category. OK, so what does this mean? I mean, first thing that's what's interesting to note is I'm defining the, this notion in the homotopy 2 category. That's kind of cool. Right, so, so B, again, is an object of an infinity 2 category. Uh, the infinity 2 category, the standing assumption is it has certain cellular weighted limits. In particular, it has cotensors by categories or simplicial sets. So I can form B to the delta. So this is the cotensor in the infinity 2 category. And I have a constant functor, uh, which uh, comes from precomposing with the unique map from delta to the point. I have an identity functor. And then the data of a totalization is a functor tote, so a one simplex like this. And then a two cell in the homotopy two category. So this is an uh, equivalence class of one simplices in one of the HOM quasi-categories. Uh, so that is the data of 
a totalization. So this, this two cell is a map from the constant at the totalization to the identity. This encodes the limit cone of the totalization. And then there's some universal property that I'm not going to spell out for you, but it's expressed entirely in the two category. This absolute right lifting diagram is dual to the notion of like a right con extension. Absolute means it's preserved by uh, restriction along any functor. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I t apply this homotopy two category functor. Yeah, that's exactly it. That's surprising. Is there a few papers that have asked why that is there? Uh, it is surprising. Uh, maybe I'll say that. Say that. Uh, so in the case of quasi categories, uh, we prove that this is the same notion of limits that has already been accepted. Already the accepted, I guess, back to Joyal again, notion of limits. So um, there's a strong argument in the complete Siegel space case that this is the right thing in that the there's a two category of complete Siegel spaces that is equivalent, bi-equivalent as a two category to the two category of quasi categories. That's a result of Zhen Lin Lo, who's a PhD student at Cambridge. So, so yeah, it's surprising. Um, it's also really, really easy to work with. So it's, and we're happy with this definition. Um, so you're saying, I guess your answer to this is that this would describe not just limitation, but any kind of homotopy two limit, uh, homotopy limit in, in the system. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Uh, right, exactly. So, so the first thing I should say is that there are equivalent forms of the definition of totalization that are maybe a little easier. Um, so firstly, that there's just an adjunction in the homotopy 2 category. That's exactly equivalent to this absolute right lifting diagram. Or of course, I could say that there's a homotopy coherent adjunction between the constant and the totalization functor. The reason I didn't uh, start with these definitions is that's the one we actually use, firstly. And secondly, we can do a generalization to not asking that B admits totalizations of all cosimplicial objects, but of certain cosimplicial objects. So you can imagine having in a sub-object here of certain cosimplicial objects, and then only having the totalization defined on that sub-object. And let's illustrate that now. So there's a classical theorem in homotopy theory. Uh, which is that the totalization of a simplicial, co-simplicial object that emits an augmentation and then extra degeneracies or a splitting uh, is just evaluated the augmentation. So these extra maps mean that the totalization is just that thing. So I'm now going to give you a context-free proof of that result because, again, it's all in the weights. So how does this go? Well, so sorry, firstly, the precise statement is that I have an absolute right lifting diagram. Uh, and to say that a simplicial object is, admits an augmentation and extra degeneracies says, uh, co-simplicial, excuse me, it says that it's in the image of this restriction functor. So I'm going to say, if I have this extra structure, then I just evaluate at the augmentation, and that defines the totalization. So how does this go? Well, it's all in the weights. So if I just look at the weights here, these are the shapes. This is a diagram in CAT. Things are contravariant, so the arrows go around. So this restriction came from the inclusion. The evaluation came from the functor that picks out that initial object. And we have the unique thing. And then there's a two cell in cat, which comes from the constant thing at the initial object of delta infinity uh, to the inclusion. And this is an absolute right extension diagram in categories. And moreover, it's witnessed equationally by some adjunctions that I'm not going to describe. That means it's preserved by any two functor or any, well, any two functor, so I just apply the cotensor, and that's why it's true. So, okay, right. <laughs> so how do we actually prove the monadicity and descent theorems? Um, so an important step is that an algebra is a geometric realization of a canonical simplicial object involving free algebras, or a descent datum is a totalization of a canonical cosimplicial object involving free <coughs> descent data. So again, the precise statements of these involve absolute right lifting diagrams. And you may notice that I've uh, labeled the two cells in each case with the same thing that I used on the previous slide, the same kappa. The data of these limit and co-limit things are the same two cell that appeared previously. So there's some natural transformation in categories from the inclusion of delta into delta plus to I guess the initial, or sorry, from the initial object to the inclusion of delta to delta plus, that same two cell is what makes both of these things true. You just do some weights calculation and you get these results. Okay, so now we can finally prove the monadicity 
and descent theorems. And again, I don't have to say anything about the proof because it's exactly as you did it classically. So descent theorem says roughly that for any homotopy coherent monad in an infinity two category with cellular weighted limits, Firstly, I have these canonical maps. This is the one that I defined previously, just arising from the weights. Uh, it admits a right adjoint if B has totalizations. Um, it is full and faithful if the elements of B are totalizations of their monad resolution. So they, they have these canonical diagrams, and I can ask that those are totalizations. And it's an equivalence if co-monadicity is satisfied. So their effective descent is essentially a translation of the Beck monadicity conditions into to this. Okay. Um, there's also a dual theory of co-monadic co-descent where I just replace the weight categories with their opposites. Nothing changes. So that, that works equally well in this context. Uh, finally, the monadicity theorem. So this is if you have any homotopy coherent adjunction in an infinity two category with these cellular weighted limits, we can extract from it the homotopy coherent monad, define the monadic homotopy coherent adjunction. I get a comparison map. This is, again, a component of a simplicial natural transformation. So everything commutes strictly. All the higher simplices commute strictly on the nose. Now I can say that there's a left adjoint to this comparison if A has geometric realizations of U-split simplicial objects. Again, there's a weighted limits uh, definition of what that means. And it's an adjoint equivalence if U creates these co-limits. So again, the proof is precisely analogous to the classical categorical case. Um, I think I'll stop there. So thanks very much. Thank you.